I am not a beekeeper. Uh, I study bees, but I don't keep them. And as I explained to Jerry earlier, um, uh, we own a five acre reconstructed prairie savanna and um, uh, the University of Illinois uh, bee research facility has an uh, apiary sort of scattered throughout the county and, and our uh, prairie savanna lot is used um, as an ape for, as a home for uh, a university apiary. So I'm a bee landlord, but I am not a beekeeper um, because the university beekeeper takes care of them. So I'm a university professor. I know esoteric useless things, um, which I hope will be interesting and maybe in some way um, be use, useful in a more esoteric sense. But uh, uh, but I, yeah, so I, I have to say you all, all know more practical things about bees than I do. Uh, but again, I, I, my first paper about bees was about bees as symbols in heraldry. So not much practical there. Um, also not a real citation success either, but that's neither here nor there. So, uh, so um, when Carolus Linnaeus, the great systematist of the 18th century, uh, took upon himself to name all the known uh, organisms of the era, when he came across um, the Western honeybee, he chose, um, the La everything was in Latin those days, he chose to call it Apis mellifera uh, in 1758. Uh, it's literally Latin for the bee that carries honey. Uh, and it was a fairly accurate descriptor, except Honey's really only moved around in the hive. Most of their uh, carrying uh, is accomplished as foragers and they're actually carrying nectar rather than honey. But that said, uh, the fact that they carry nectar and process it into honey did not escape notice by um, humans throughout history. It's one of the reasons that, that they, uh, Linnaeus gave the name honey, uh, the bee who carries honey because honey has been very important to humans for a very long period of time, more than 9,000 years as uh, evidenced by um, uh, cave art dating back to 7,000 BC and, and older. There's actually African uh, rock art that goes back before that. So people were willing to risk uh, the um, wrath of bees defending their hive using their stingers and the like for this extraordinary substance. Um, and uh, to some extent that continues today. Beyond a dozen references to honey in the Old Testament, uh, there's archeological evidence that there was a large apiary um, that dates back to the 10th century BCE, which is the reign of King Solomon. So it is biblical times in Tel Rehov in Israel. So it's a functioning apiary, at least a hundred uh, of these uh, clay hives which uh, although some uh, rabbis insist that references in the uh, Old Testament to honey actually refer to date syrup, it doesn't work because many of the references talk about honey dripping from rocks and that's not what date syrup does. Uh, so we've had a, a long association, not just collecting honey from wild bees, but also um, bringing them under some human uh, management. So among the most appealing attributes of honey is it's sweet. It is a natural sweet substance, intensely sweet. Intensely sweet substances are really rare. Uh, and uh, throughout the Middle Ages, honey was basically the only sweetener that was available to Europeans. But in the 16th century, Spanish and Portuguese merchants introduced sugar cane into the new, new world tropics, which could produce a sweet substance only human energy had to go into its production rather than exploiting bee energy. Uh, and its cultivation and processing for extraction was facilitated by enslaving Africans and other non-white populations. And that's the only reason it became that sucrose or table sugar became a cost-effective honey replacement. And eventually uh, honey fell to some extent from favor. And it was in the mid 1990s uh, that even the, the nutritional science community started to disparage honey. And this is about the time I started getting interested in bees through honey. Um, and it, I, I knew that honey is made of nectar, uh, a plant substance. I was at the time studying plant-insect interactions as mediated by phytochemicals, plants uh, 
chemicals produced by plants. And I thought that this amazing substance was not given the respect it, it, uh, it deserves. So for example, the British Journal of Nutrition revisited uh, a reappraised honey and pre-industrial diets. And, and uh, this uh, paper can uh, include in the abstract the I thought nonsensical so, uh, sentence, nutritionally honey is a little different from sugar basically being a concentrated solution of fructose and glucose with only physiological insignificant traces of vitamins and minerals, which did not seem uh, really quite fair. Later in the article, refined sugar may not have displaced more nutrient rich items, but only the nutritionally com comparable food honey. And I thought they're missing, they're missing the whole point. And you can see in 19, also this is 1997, um, uh, that the, Potassium and vitamins for the quantities of honey eaten are nutritionally negligible. Here's another paper from 96. Mineral and vitamin is very low. Given the low consumption of honey, they're of no significant nutritional benefit. I thought that was disrespectful of bees. Uh, and I thought that because uh, honey is so much more than just sweetness. It has a very long uh, history of use as medicine. You can go all the way back to uh, the, um, Egyptian temples with beekeepers shown in hieroglyphics, blowing smoke into hives um, and removing honeycombs. Uh, here from uh, Dioscorides uh, in the first century AD, uh, preparations of, of honey uh, and recipes for medicine all the way through um, to the uh, 18th century with herbals touting the virtues of honey and preventing many of uh, the worst disorders and certain cure of several others. Things began to change actually right about that time in the mid 1990s. And that's because a concept uh, was, uh, began to undergo development in nutritional science is the concept of, of a functional, functional food. So functional food is a food um, that has biologically active components that impart health benefits or desirable physiological effects other than strict nutrition. They're sometimes called nutraceuticals because of their pharmaceutical properties, their physiological activities that provide health benefits. So, um, so these are nutrients perhaps in concentrations in excess of what, are, what nutritional needs are. But these are, uh, because of the presence of phytochemicals, these are foods that have function other than to satiate hunger, uh, but actually have healthful impacts on consumers. So um, concept of honey as healthful has been steadily increasing ever since that time. Uh, now, if you read tabloid newspapers, you might believe that honey can cure anything. Um, and it's when you look at the list of all these uh, internet posts of top, top eight unknown benefits, well, maybe they are unknown. Um, you can't imagine why bees would make a substance that, for example, relieves hangovers, even though bees will consume alcohol. It's not, we, no one knows that they have hangovers or whether they have ulcers. Um, um, so it, it's hard to imagine why bees imbue their honey with, with uh, such um, functional properties, such nutraceutical properties. So we know a whole lot more, more, at least when I got in, interested in honey, a lot more was known of the benefits of consuming honey to humans than the benefits of consuming honey other than providing energy to bees themselves. So the reason I was skeptical that honey was basically sugar water is that it's made of nectar and nectar is a yes, sugar rich floral uh, secretion that is manufactured for the sole purpose as a reward for an animal partner. Nectar has no function in the life of a plant other than to reward a mutualistic partner such as a pollinator. It's, it is 80% or so water. It, primary constituents are sugars, glucose, fructose, sucrose, and it has uh, dilute uh, complex vitamins. But what <clears throat> was, people were overlooking is the fact that nectar as a plant secretion contains everything, uh, honey is made from nectar and nectar contains everything that plants make basically and other plant parts. So other plant parts um, produce phytochemicals with, uh, for the purpose of, of um, allowing plants, which can't run away from their enemies, 
to essentially protect themselves from would-be consumers, including bacteria and fungi, also insects. So some of these phytochemicals are very familiar. Everybody knows garlic uh, has that sulfurous compound, diallyl sulfide, uh, um, resveratrol in grapes, all of, uh, all of the glucosinolates that are in cabbage and broccoli, sulforaphane, for example. Um, so these virtually all phytochemicals that appear in some part of the plant can be found in nectar. And what do bees do with nectar? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. They concentrate it. So why do they concentrate it? Uh, it's very hard to make a living on nectar and pollen for that matter. Very, very few animals um, manage that. Almost everything that, that, for example, in the adult phase feeds on nectar got most of their nutrition in their um, uh, immature stages on other foods. Bees have accomplished this, and uh, uh, that's a really remarkable uh, uh, physiological treat. Because neither food is particularly easy to eat, and, and it's hard to depend on because an individual bee can't carry much uh, at a time. 85% of her body weighs about a tenth of a gram, so it's energetically expensive to harvest nectar. She'll uh, average uh, forager will make about 30 trips in a day, visiting 50 to 100 flowers per trip. In her month long life, a forager can visit 90,000 up and upwards of uh, flowers. And it takes a million flowers to make up just one pound of honey. So that's a uh, magnificent social uh, life that uh, uh, characterizes the, the honeybee hive <clears throat> is a, a, a part of the reason for the successful uh, utilization of of nectar and pollen as foods so as a, for the superorganism, A productive colony can make 200 pounds per season. And as everybody probably knows, um, the first step in bringing this substance, it's 80% water or, or so with a low concentration of sugar, the first thing that bees do to convert nectar to honey is reduce the water content. It goes from about 80 to 90% down to 13 to 18%. So foragers arrive, offload nectar to hive bees, who concentrate the nectar by regurgitating droplets onto their tongues, sucking up, spitting it out uh, by spreading it onto their tongues. It increases the surface area and makes evaporation more efficient. Um, so while some bees are regurgitating, others in the colony are fanning their win wings 200 plus times per second. This gets air circulating and also accelerates the evaporation process. And eventually um, the Solution uh, 80 to 90 percent goes down to about 13 to 80 percent. Essentially, becomes a super saturated sugar solution, <clears throat> and and uh, as you can see from the water content, honeybees are among the very best of bees at reducing the concentration of uh, of um, of driving out the water of nectar to make very concentrated honey. Um, so there they are, uh, and they beat um, all, even their other social relatives. Okay, evaporation is just one of the chemical changes. Uh, again, you probably know that bees use the enzyme invertase, sometimes called sucrase or saccharase. Uh, and this is an enzyme that works on uh, sucrose, which is a disaccharide made of two sugars. Uh, and it breaks the bond that connects them uh, into its component monosaccharides, or simple sugars, fructose, five-membered, um, carbon uh, ring and uh, glucose with six carbons. Now this conversion serves several purposes. If you break sucrose into its component monosaccharides, that's pre-digesting it. So it makes it easier for grubs and workers to process and, to, and consume. Also, because fructose is more soluble in water than sucrose, um, Increasing fructose at the expense of sucrose actually reduces the likelihood of crystallization. Uh, basically, what determines how likely a honey is to crystallize is the ratio of um, glucose to fructose. So breaking it up, um, reducing the concentration of sucrose, breaking it up into glucose and fructose reduces the likelihood of crystallization. Also, con converting sucrose into fructose and glucose turns one molecule into two molecules in solution. And what that does is it increases the osmotic potential. And that is the, um, you have a, a, a solution with more molecules. So nature does not like an imbalance. So if you have a water-filled microbe here, 
um, that's swimming in honey, what will happen is the honey will draw water out of um, the organism because the water concentration is higher outside than it is inside the organism, it's outside. So by simple diffusion and osmosis, um, the water gets drawn out and that can basically bust up the bacteria, um, which means honey um, is, um, most microorganisms cannot exist in this super saturated solution because they lose water and uh, then, then they die. Uh, so uh, that's another benefit of, of this conversion. One more benefit too, so uh, by producing glucose, glucose becomes a substrate for an enzyme called um, glucose oxidase here. And what that does in the, with uh, oxygen basically can produce hydrogen peroxide, which is a chemostellarant um, and uh, uh, by action of, so hydrogen peroxide acted on by another enzyme catalytes, re regenerates the oxygen. Now, at this conversion uh, using oxygen to make hydrogen peroxide, the other product is uh, basically it's um, gluconolactone. And this is in the presence of water unstable and becomes uh, the end product gluconic acid. So this glucose to gluconic acid conversion ends up lowering the pH of uh, the incipient honey. And low pH is also um, uh, detrimental to uh, the survival of my microbes. So all these things, hydrogen peroxide, uh, which can uh, kill microbes, low pH, which can kill microbes, and this osmotic potential, all help to make honey uh, anti uh, inimical to the survival of microbes, which is great if you want to store something because if you, for a long period of time. You don't want to store food that is eventually going to be fermented or is going to be uh, otherwise spoiled by bacterial colonization. All right, after the biochemical processing, incipient honey is packaged by placing it into wax cells. And in, as it, the cells are not capped and in the heat of the hive, uh, this is like 95 degrees, this facilitates evaporation of water. And it does one other thing for bees. At that temperature, incubating at that temperature, some of the toxic nectar constituents stuff that shows in, that's present in nectar, these phytochemicals that help uh, flowers uh, protect themselves again in, against inappropriate consumers. So uh, flowers don't want their nectar to be colonized bacteria any more than bees want their honey. So uh, the toxic, some of the toxic constituents are actually broken down at hive temperature. This is a study done of nectar of uh, an aloe plant uh, freshly deposited and then uh, after incubation um, at hive temperatures. So the number of phenolics and many phenolics can be in high concentration toxic to bees get broken down. So in a sense, bees cook honey and it's kind of like humans. We invented cooking in part to help reduce the toxicity of foods. And, and that's really remarkable. Uh, very few examples of other animal cooks. All right. so. It is a processed food. Honey is probably the oldest processed food. It's processed by bees, not by, by humans. And it is very complex and labor intensive and you can't do it very easily unless you have 30,000 nest mates to depend on to help you out. So why do they go all, to, to all this trouble? Well, there's an obvious answer and then there's a subtle answer as well that has been overlooked for many decades. And the obvious answer is, um, for the carbohydrates, for the sugar content. Honey is what makes the energetic, energy intensive honeybee lifestyle possible. So they live year round, not many, not many bees do that. They're perennial, they have perennial colonies, 30, 50,000 workers, uh, and they make, uh, they eat pollen and they eat bee bread, which is a, a fermented product from honey, uh, from pollen and honey, which is made from nectar. So the, Sugar rich nectar is a basis for honey and honey is the stored form of carbohydrates that they use for their baby grubs and is an energy source uh, for adult workers. It's also a metabolic fuel for heating the hive. Honeybees, again, very, among very few of um, social insects that can maintain a colony year round, very few um, bees. We're talking about yellow jackets, they can't do it. 
Um, in, in winter is again, everybody in the other room knows they huddle in the cluster and eat honey for energy, shiver and generate metabolic heat and can maintain their hive temperatures at 63 degrees or so Fahrenheit, even when outside temperatures drop to below zero, um, below 18, below. Uh, that's kind of what we're gonna be seeing here in a few days here in central Illinois. And it's also fuel for manufacturing wax uh, for combs produced by the abdominal glands of one week old workers. Honey provides a metabolic fuel for producing glandular secretions, it takes about eight to 10 to 12 pounds of honey to yield a pound of wax. Okay, of the honey constituents, sugars are indeed the fuel for energy. And there are other properties of honey that are attributable to its sugar content. And that includes, as I mentioned, crystallization, water content, and as well, pH. So that's due to the the sugars of uh, glucose, fructose, sucrose, and some oligosaccharides. So that's more than two uh, sugars linked together. Yes, so some of the chemical or physical properties of honey are attributable to sugars, but so many of the other properties are not. They are attributable to honey biochemistry, which comes from nectar biochemistry. What are those properties? Color, flavor, and aroma viscosity, which is basically thickness, and the thixotrophic properties. So thixotrophic uh, solutions are basically um, that uh, gels that can, upon uh, agitation, turn into liquid. Uh, some honeys are naturally, depending on their, uh, to some degree, their amino acid content, uh, they are gels upon standing, and if you stir them, they turn into liquids. Heather honey, for example, uh, is thixotrophic. Uh, the phytochemicals are responsible for their antioxidant capacity, about which more in a minute. So basically the, the capacity to stop um, free radical chain reactions. And the osmotic potential uh, is also influenced by uh, the phytochemicals. What are the phytochemicals? They include um, just uh, aliphatic compounds. Those are just carbon hydrogen based alkaloids, which have nitrogen, benzene derivatives, which have um, uh, an aromatic ring, carotenoids and flavonoids, which are among the pigments, monoterpenoids, which uh, are included among the uh, volatiles that give uh, honey distinctive uh, aromas, organic acids, which add to the taste, and those uh, very abundant phenolics. Okay, flavonoids, phenolics, and carotenoids are among the phytochemicals in honey that contribute to color and taste. And here are some of them. These are the flavonoids, uh, and they include uh, uh, compounds such as uh, pinosembrin, chrysin, uh, quercetin, which is in uh, pollen, as well as some nectars. Um, Kempferol is just an isomer of quercetin, pinobanksin. Uh, you notice this pino name. A uh, number of these are actually more abundant in propolis than they are in, um, well, in the resins that go into propolis. And then we have the phenolic acids, um, which are numerous as well. Picumeric acid is one in particular. And you know, of course, color, you are probably all familiar with honey color charts and you can thank the flavonoids and phenolics and carotenoids for that. So these are among the phytochemicals in honey that are antioxidants. So that's a molecule that can share an electron and stabilize what would otherwise be a, a free radical. So this is a, a, a chemical compound in search of an electron to fill this outer ring of electrons. Because uh, if you're missing an electron, this molecule wants nothing more than to fill that ring with a, another um, electron. And antioxidants are chemicals that by virtue of their, um, their unique properties can afford to lose uh, an electron to another molecule without themselves um, becoming uh, what rapacious uh, uh, grabbers of electrons from other molecules. Uh, so antioxidants, um, these, all of these molecules have antioxidant properties. You can just see um, oxygen, uh, which is an ox you know, oxidizer, hence the name, <clears throat> has a tendency to form these uh, um, free radicals. So. This is oxygen, ground state oxygen. It's nice and stable, but if you remove an electron, it can form these um, free radicals like superoxide and ion. Peroxide is another one that tends to form these free radical chain reactions. 
hydrogen peroxide and hydroxyl radical hydroxyl ion. ion. When oxygen for, uh, is you know, elevated to an excited state, that's what uh, biochemists call it, uh, it then can actually become toxic. That's it's called pro-oxidant molecules will initiate these chain reactions with one molecules grabbing elections one from another. And these are sorts of um, oxidative changes are associated with many disease conditions um, in, in humans. Cancer, for example, is thought to be, um, uh, well, anti these free radical chain reactions are thought to contribute to aging processes and, and including cancer. By neutralizing free radicals, antioxidant molecules are thought to have a wide range of health benefits for humans. And you see them advertised everywhere. Uh, antioxidants uh, increase longevity, antioxidants, uh, um, well, here's more longevity enhancement, more, you know, so they, they will make you live longer and have healthier lives, health, health span. Um, and they're all kinds of products you can buy online at health food stores that purport to enhance longevity and increase your health through stopping these free radical chain reactions. But are they present in sufficient amounts to improve human health? Um, that's a question. And uh, that was a question we got interested in just around the time that I was trying to convince people that honey was more than just sugar water. Uh, so the way we approached this, this was uh, um, in collaboration with my very famous uh, bee biologist co colleague, um, Jean Robinson, uh, and uh, one of my graduate students, Sue Stephen Frankel. Uh, what we did was collect monofloral. So monofloral honeys come from the nectar of principally one flower species. Okay, now the character, the thing about uh, these phytochemicals is they tend to be idiosyncratically distributed ac uh, across the plant kingdom. So certain families have certain types of phytochemicals that are very different from the phytochemicals in another family. So the honeys that are made from a single floral source contain the phytochemicals from that floral source, which may be completely absent from other floral uh, sources. So if you look at uniflorals or mon monofloral honeys, you should see differences in the antioxidant capacity depending on the nectar source on which they were based. So we looked at 14 monofloral's um, with fun that varied in color from 3.6 to 15. Uh, and we measured their antioxidant content. And among those 14 honeys, there was 20 fold variation in antioxidant content with buckwheat, Illinois buckwheat down at the bottom. Uh, Illinois buckwheat, well, buckwheat in general, this is like uh, the darkest of dark honeys, sort of consistency and appearance of molasses. And it is just incredibly jam packed with antioxidants. In fact, at levels that exceed more uh, traditional um, antioxidant foods, such as spinach and tomato or garlic, and it tastes so much better than spinach, tomato, and garlic. And that's where this is again, this is what finally, um, this kind of penetrated the zeitgeist. People recognize that honey, you know, they sell it based on its antioxidant power. Here you see antioxidant power honey. Uh, and here in this ad for buckwheat honey, it's rich in vitamins, minerals, enzymes, and antioxidants. So we're 180 degrees away from the mid nineties. And now honey is a health food. Um, and uh, my colleague here, uh, Nikki Ingeseth in food science actually showed experimentally that uh, black tea of people, men in, an, uh, in, a, in a trial who were fed black or consumed black tea with honey actually had um, uh, lower oxidized serum lipids than did those uh, consuming sugar, uh, sugar sweetened honey. So uh, there no, she was also showed that uh, honey from different sources are differentially able to prevent enzymatic browning in fruit. So um, in vegetables, you remember if you know if you slice an apple, it turns brown. If you treat it with honey, it won't because of the antioxidants in honey, uh, and and so on. So it's now sort of a I don't know a cottage industry um, uh, to promote the antioxidant content of honeys. And it's now considered a functional food for humans, but is it a functional food for honey, for honeybees? Well, that's, again, it was subject of uh, uh, attention in our lab. We really became intrigued. You noticed in, in all the, the, the hype for um, in health food stores that 
antioxidants enhance longevity? Our question is, could honeys enhance longevity of honeybees? And we looked at uh, two very prominent compounds in most honeys, widely distributed. One I mentioned earlier, quercetin, um, uh, and, uh, which is widespread in, in honeys, as is picomeric acid. Picomeric acid is actually abundant pollen in a sense, but is the monomer, the sort of building block of sporopollenin, which is the outer um, covering of uh, exine of a pollen grain. So if it's broken down into its component parts, like a beaded necklace, you pull the beads apart, it's picomeric acid. So you look at the color coding. This was a, a, a Ling Shu Liao at the time, uh, well, a postdoc, when uh, Yen Wu, who's a student, um, uh, basically uh, tested the longevity of honeybees after they emerged as adults, um, fed on either sugar water or sugar water plus uh, picomeric acid, sugar water plus quercetin, and sugar water plus both. So follow the, uh, the colors here. That's the control, just sugar water. Uh, here is the blue is picomeric acid and the green is quercetin. And you can see here, particularly if they consume both, these bees live uh, substantially longer than they do on sugar water, um, upwards of up to five to 10 days longer. So yeah, they do enhance the longevity. Um, now beyond antioxidant content, honey is known to possess antimicrobial activities. Mentioned all, all of those, the hydrogen peroxide, sterilizing agent, gluconic acid lowers the pH, discourages microbial growth. But some honeys have antimicrobial activities is not linked to that peroxide production. Remember the production of gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. They have their own non-peroxide antibacterial activity. And the most famous of those um, is uh, Manuka honey, which you've probably heard about. It's now sold as medical grade with uh, what was called unique Manuka factor. This is a, 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 a shrub uh, that grows in um, New Zealand, Leptospermum. And uh, it's, it's honey contains a compound um, that, uh, it's called dihydroxyacetone. It's in the Manuka flower nectar. And when it's processed, it becomes a compound called methy methoglyoxal, which is phenomenally, phenomenally antimicrobial. In fact, it's even effective against MRSA, methicillin resistant Streptococcus aureus, which is um, the flesh eating bacteria, or at least related to flesh eating bacteria, very difficult to treat. It's resistant to uh, many drugs that typically work on microbes. In fact, this is such a well-known, document, well-documented phenomenon that the FDA has approved, officially approved the use of Manuka in wound dressing. Um, and uh, you can buy wound dressing, you know, band bandages that are soaked in, that provide Manuka honey, all kinds of skin products um, that supposedly help moisturize skin, um, all because of the Manuka honey. Uh, and it's so popular now that uh, New Zealand reported in 2014, producing 1700 tons of Manuka honey. Remember, that's where the plant grows naturally. That's where it's officially produced. But over 10,000 tons of Manuka honey in 2014 was, uh, were sold on the global market. So a lot of that was counterfeit. It was uh, um, fake fake Manuka. Uh, and uh, you can see many news stories, um, impure honey, fake Manuka. Uh, there are all kinds of lawsuits here in the US as well. Uh, Trader Joe's, um, there was a court decision um, in the Ninth Circuit, which includes Alameda County Appeals Court. And it was okay that um, you know, the uh, Trader Joe's Manuka honey was advertised as 100% Manuka, even though the pollen indicated it was only 60% of the honey. Uh, so why was the court, the court ruled that that was fine um, because context had to be considered and a reasonable consumer's background knowledge. So a, a reasonable consumer would not know or would not care uh, or would not understand what it meant to be 100% Manuka. Um, so, that's uh, the 
uh, appeals court of the Ninth Circuit um, decided it's okay uh, to sell counterfeit manuka honey. Um, so uh, antimicrobial non-peroxide uh, components of, of many honeys um, are toxic actually to uh, enemies of bees, including American foul brood here, uh, Pinobacillus larvae. Um, uh, you can see here um, that this is effective honey on parasites, pathogens, and predators. Um, there's uh, stone brood, Aspergillus flavus and Aspergillus ni niger. Stone brood is uh, a fungus uh, that can be pathogenic uh, and uh, manuka, uh, honeys in general um, prevent uh, fungal growth in vitro and in, in vitro assays. And then here, Nosema apis and Nosema, Nosema serrani, uh, the microsporidian or fun fungi that um, uh, cause no, uh, Nosema infections. Um, and uh, many constituents of honey are um, uh, effective against Nosema. And the most amazing thing about bees, and as I said before, I started uh, in the casual conversation part, bees are scary smart and they do things that, that people can't even do. And uh, 2014, for example, Gehrman et al in uh, a study showed that nurse bees that were affected, infected with Nosema serrani, this gut parasite, actually preferentially uh, when uh, given a choice would consume the honey that had the highest uh, antifungal, antimicrobial activity. They could choose which honey amongst all the honeys um, that they were presented with or that in a natural situation would be present in a hive because bees forage all over the landscape, uh, all, all spring, summer, fall long and, and the, the different honeys have different composition. They know which is best for which disease. This behavior is a highly adaptive form of therapeutic medication at the individual and colony level, which is astonishing. I don't know what, if I go to the drugstore, what to buy to make me feel better. One more attribute of uh, uh, honey uh, is that honey has constituents that, that turn on or upregulate genes that encode enzymes that break down foreign substances, poisons, environmental poisons. The most the workhorse enzymes for most aerobic organisms are called the cytochrome P450 monooxygenases. That's a mouthful, call them just P450s. Uh, and basically what they do is take a, a fat soluble or lipophilic uh, substrate and by adding an oxygen functionality like hydroxyl group, increase its water solubility. Once it's more water sol soluble, it can get exported out of the body. Uh, so there are some P450s that actually are biosynthetic, so they make compounds. They make uh, stero steroid hormones and and um, mammal mammals. They make sterols that go into insect hormones, such as uh, ecdysone, the molting hormone. Um, they make pheromones, but the vast majority are uh, take foreign substances, not ones that are in the body, but outside in the environment, and they break them down. They make them less toxic and get help get them out of the body. These are all the attributes. Most uh, organisms have what's called a sipome, a collection of P450s. We have about a hundred genes encoding P450s. The honeybee has 46. They have very different structures, very different activities, although mostly oxidative reactions. And what's shared was called a heme binding signature motif. So this is a, a um, amino acids in the protein that allow the protein to bind to um, uh, heme, which contains iron, which brings about that uh, movement of the oxygen from one molecule to another. They're also the enzyme that break down pesticides for bees. So by in, what honey can do is turn them on, turn on these genes called upregulation. So here you see, um, again, work from uh, my lab from student, um, uh, Reed Johnson along with the postdoc, Wen Fu Mao, and a number of other uh, students. Uh, so you give them honey extract and you can see um, select uh, several of these P450s um, out of the 46 uh, get turned on uh, and are uh, produced in greater quantities. Um, so by turning on these enzymes, 
this allows bees, the first thing we discovered is allow bees to survive certain hive toxins, including aflatoxin B1. And that is a mycotoxin. That's a, tungus, a toxin produced by a fungus. It is produced by aspergillus, which we talked about, the causative agent of st stone brood. Um, and it, it actually helps bees survive better than um, when they have honey, uh, they survive better in the presence of aflatoxin than they do eating um, sugar or, or corn syrup. So uh, honey has all kinds of phytochemicals in it. And uh, um, it does not, of the, has four, here are all the cytochrome P450s, all 46 of them from uh, the honeybee. This was a, um, a study that was done uh, by Manjan et al. Just brilliant work from 2018. Man, he, they managed to look at every single one of these and test its functionality. Uh, and the, their particular interest was which ones of the, we know that there are some like this, what were called CYP6AS, the ones I just showed, they, they, they call them subfamilies. It's very hard to organize these P450s and they have names that are totally forgettable. But CYP6AS seems to metabolize um, food constituents. Um, but there is one group um, that's called uh, CYP9Q that actually uh, is responsible for the detoxification of Kumafos and Taufuvalinate. Those are two acaricides, not used so much anymore, but used for a very long time uh, to control varroa mites and honeybees. And these are the, these uh, CYP9Q um, enzymes are what allow honeybees to survive in the presence of tau fluvalinate and kumafos, which can kill the mites. Uh, so it fits right into the, um, what's called the catalytic site of the, of the molecule. And it seems to be the only one that handles pesticides. That's what Manjan et al. found. So we were very interested in what compounds in honey, we knew honey turned up the, those genes, which compounds did it? And we found um, good inducers. This was uh, postdoc Wen Fu Mao's work. Picumaric acid, which remember is in sporopollenin, this polymer that um, makes up the exine or outer coat of the pollen. And these pinobanksin, pinobanksin 5-methyl ether, pinosembrin all very good at upregulating or turning on the detoxification genes. Um, and uh, these appear to get into honey through propolis, which is a, a, another story. So um, we wanted to see with these two compounds independently, which remember enhance the life of the honeybee, they also turn on um, the a bunch of detoxification genes, including the ones that metabolize the honey constituents and the CYP9Q that break down foreign substances like pesticides. And they also break, uh, induce um, immunity genes, including uh, the um, antimicrobial peptide of basin. Now the detoxification it happens in three steps. First, you change the structure of the, of the poison, then you attach it to a molecule to get move it out of the body. And then uh, there's phase three is essentially pumping it, pumping it further out, uh, you know, so out of the cells and then out of the body. Uh, and honey, picomeric acid turns them all on. And when, then we looked at the larvae uh, and found that picomeric acid in the larvae turn on even more cytochrome P450 genes, as well as some of these um, uh, phase two genes. And look at all the antimicrobial uh, uh, peptides, the immunity genes that this one compound turns on in, in grubs and in adults. <clears throat> what does it do to insects? Again, um, with another graduate student, Ling Shu, uh, looked to see what happened to longevity when there's a pesticide present, including the neonicotinoid uh, imidacloprid, and follow the colors. Again, you see this is uh, quercetin, um, bees that are feeding on sugar water to which quercetin has been added live longer. Um, and uh, in fact, and here you see they live longer um, when they're given imidacloprid at high concentrations when they have both picomeric acid and quercetin present. So picomeric acid alone increases honeybee longevity um, at, the, at con low concentrations, quercetin alone, and in combination with picomeric acid, enhance bee longevity in the presence of uh, neonicotinoid pesticide. And picomeric acid is just one of dozens of phenolic acids and flavonoid constituents that upregulate or turn on the CYP9Qs. So honey helps bees deal with 
foreign substances, poisons in the environment. I mentioned those propolis, com uh, propolis? Um, propolis appears to be, uh, remember bees line all kinds of surfaces, including cell surfaces with this material, they gather resins from certain plants in the environment and then make propolis and spread it around. And, and, and when propolis has water soluble constituents, so when honey is being cured in, um, inside propolis lined cells, we believe that this is how these uh, propol propolis flavonoids get into honey. All right, other phytochemicals and honey affect behavior, enhance memory, caffeine, yes. Caffeine improves memory of bees and uh, helps their cognitive performance and motivation in learning complex tasks. So yes, bees, bees need their uh, caffeine fix too. Um, so honey is a functional food for bees. And bee beekeeping cost-saving practices substituting sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, which in the 70s was thought to have, uh, uh, to be, to have no consequences at all uh, toxicologically, in fact, may compromise toxicological and immunological defenses of bees. So a colony of necessity, because they live all year long, use many species of plants over the course of a year to collect nectar and pollen for their honey and bee bread. And they may require phytochemical diversity in their diet. Remember, they're using this as a medicine chest. Uh, but pollen and nectar are getting harder to find. The US has more acreage of lawn turf grass than corn, soybeans, orchards, vineyards, and nut trees put together. And lawns receive more pesticide applications than even agricultural land. Monoculture, agriculture does not provide a diverse diet. This is where I live. This is Champaign County. I do not have to tell you that the yellow squares are corn and the green squares are soybeans. All the other plants, all the other colors are really hard to find. Um, the, Plant diversity is very low and it's, uh, corn is kind of useless. So we mean that at least produces nectar, but uh, corn is just, produces a low quality pollen. Coast to coast, clean wheat free, free fields without fences, no nectar and uh, nesting resources for wild bees. And for 20 years, persistent drought in the Western US associated with climate change means migratory beekeepers have trouble finding enough food for their bees. And so you can see the states um, with the worst drought are also the states where uh, many beekeepers take their bees uh, uh, to, uh, to feed and to overwinter. Bees rely on phytochemicals, not just to live longer and to deal with toxins, but as feeding cues to differentiate, for example, junk food like soda, which they'll consume from flowers. It's based on the fact that corn syrup comes from a monocot, mo uh, corn, Corn has a different photosynthetic pathway than, than do um, the uh, dicots or the usual flowers with lots of nectar and the like. Um, and uh, corn, so that changes because of the different photosynthetic pathway, it changes the ratio of carbon isotopes. So you can tell what bees have, uh, have consumed by the carbon um, isotope ratios. So here you see, you may be surprising in North Carolina, and, uh, in, in cities, in a city, um, the open circles are managed um, bees and they have much higher uh, carbon 13. That's because they're being fed sugars um, by the beekeepers. The unmanaged bees um, in, uh, at least in, uh, well, in general uh, are feeding on more natural sources. So they can find flowers in a landscape full of corn syrup uh, and processed food. And those phytochemicals are important recognition cues for them. But they can do this, differentiate flowers from corn syrup, you know, healthy, healthful phytochemical rich nectar from corn syrup, only if there are flowers around. Nectar and pollen shortages may have consequences beyond starvation if bees start eating things they shouldn't, like hummingbird artificial nectar, the red bees of Red Hook in Brooklyn where they were feeding on maraschino, uh, cherry fluids from the, uh, the Maraschino cherry factory down the street. Here they are, uh, Coke and Pepsi, apparently both popular by bees. This was a, a Utah beekeeper who dumped a bunch of candy canes and ended up with bees that were making red honey from candy cane, um, dissol uh, dissolved candy cane. Uh, and uh, many others, are all kinds of unnatural foods that bees uh, are 
kind of forced to resort to eating. So today there's a perception that honey can improve human health in all kinds of ways. Most people don't really appreciate how amazing honey is and how important it is to bees. So it may have 21 um, uh, imagined uh, benefits for humans, but it is really beneficial for bees in providing immunity, gene activation, antimicrobial properties, faster wound healing, nourishment, but longevity, improved cold tolerance. The abscisic acid, for example, helps with cold tolerance and enhanced detoxification. And honey needs flowers for phytochemicals. Will there be flowers for bees to visit in the future? Luther Birdbank, famous plant breeder said, flowers always make people better, happier and more helpful. They are sunshine, food and medicine for the soul. The same can be said for bees. And with that, thank you for listening. Thanks to our um, uh, funders for essentially the you know, Honey Board for more recent work, USDA, NIFA program. Very grateful and grateful to all the um, postdocs, graduate students, colleagues, and a special thank you to Jean Robinson who directs the Bee Research Facility. One reason there is not more bee research is it's not easy to do research on bees because the unit of replication is the hive, not the individual bee. So you need an apiary, you need, you need dozens of hives to do statistically significant research, which means you need acres of flowers. And that's, there are not many places that can provide that. I'm very fortunate to be at University of Illinois to, to have been able to do this bee research and to come visit you today virtually. And I just want to end with, this was a few winters ago uh, when my daughter for fun put together a gingerbread house over the Christmas holiday. And there was a freakish warm day and look who found it. And uh, with that, let me, I guess, um, stop the share and see if anybody has questions. And I, I didn't go over too long. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you. I have a question, May. Yes, please. Um, the antimicrobial activity that's associated with honey and its ingestion, does that antimicrobial activity take place internally in our bodies when we ingest honey? Oh, um, as, uh, as opposed to using it on ex externally? Um, right, uh, yeah. so not topically. Um, yeah, it, it, it also has uh, apparent benefits internally, but that's a really good question because it, we do digest honey. So it, I don't know how long it can retain some of those um, unique properties. Uh, you know, it, it is um, uh, uh, touted to uh, in, uh, help sore throats. Um, and honey also probably has honey constituents also probably affect our um, uh, regulation of our, some of our detoxification enzymes. I can't cite the paper, but it, picomeric acid, for reasons that are not exactly clear to me, has all kinds of uh, physiological and pharmacological activity, not just in bees, but in uh, humans as well. And, oh, and the, other I, question I, the other question I had relates to uh, crystallization of honey. So when you leave a jar of honey for a long period of time, it separates into a watery substance and a thick crystallized substance, which I'm assuming is the difference between sucrose, uh, fructose and glucose. Is that no, correct? That, that's what falls out of solution. Yeah, because- Okay. And when you, when you reheat that or warm it, will those two blend back together or is that a permanent chemical precipitate no, not not to my knowledge but if you heat it up you get the same ratio that it started with it what what happens is um basically uh that if uh, you know how you're always you're not never supposed to put the spoon back in the honey after you've licked it i mean because a is disgusting but b because <laughs> even introducing a tiny bit of water will will disrupt that um super saturation and, and uh, once, it, um, once it's no longer super saturated, uh, then, um, well, bacteria can, uh, microbes can invade. But the crystallization, how long it can remain in solution depends on, again, that ratio of 
of the simple sugars. Uh, and and uh, where were we? Right, so you don't get sucrose again. If it was okay. you know, fructose, uh, well, I don't know, 50-50 glucose sucrose, it'll be 50-50 sucrose glucose when you heat it up. It goes into solution again because uh, hot, hot water can hold more molecules than cold water. Okay. Which is thank why, you. Yeah. Okay. That that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know. Is there? There's Hal. Hal has his hand up. Thank you, May. You know, for years and years, beekeepers have been using uh, dry vert sugar for feeding bees, and I wonder if you have a comment on. The, you know, um, it's more expensive. On the other hand, you can feed it dry to bees. And I wonder if you could comment on the difference between um, dry vert sugar and, and regular um, cane sugar. I cannot. I don't know what dry vert sugar is. Well, it's a, proce it's a processed sugar <clears throat> that bakers use for making fondant and- um, Oh, okay, all right. Um, well, I, I, I don't know what effect that has on bees, frankly, but they're both in terms of nutraceutical properties, they don't have the phytochemical, neither has the phytochemicals. In it. Uh, so you don't get some of the, uh, you certainly don't get the health benefits that we get with honey. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> a, wonder, a wonderful uh, program. Thank you oh, very much. Uh, and I hope it wasn't too much of what everybody already knew. I never know what. what Are you kidding? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um okay <laughs> should i go through the okay uh and there's uh um sung, sung lee yes Hi. i have a question on i mean this is wonderful getting an insight of honey this is amazing you know um as we as much as we produce honey and then you know the people buy honey from me and us now once in a while i run into people who has a diabetes mm -hmm. and then when i recommend the honey and oh i'm diabetes and they refuse to take what how what can i record how, how can i direct them or recommend them about the honey as a as far as the sugar consumption and then all that well um my understanding about diabetics and honey is that it has to do with uh, um the, the fact that there's less sucrose and, and more fructose. Um, are you as, looking for references that will, uh, you know, scientific studies that show this? Because I can, I can send you some references if you send me an email. I can, if, is that what you're looking for? That, uh, you know, and uh, studies that have shown that there are uh, benefits to honey for diabetic? Yes, uh -huh. that would be helpful. But, but in generally speaking, do I just to deter the the diabetes use much of a consumption on the honey, or just I just saying I've been saying that just moderately, not as much as like a regular people would use. Well, that is a point because honey is actually sweeter, <laughs> you know, per unit weight um, mm -hmm. than uh, sugar. So to get that same sugar kick. Um, yeah you use less, uh -huh. um, but uh, in terms of, you know, I, I'm not sure I would hesitate without having, you know, a whole page full of references. And if, if my email is easy, it's maybe at illinois.edu. I can put it in the chat if anybody wants to send me an email because I am very reluctant to say anything without checking the literature. Um, and by the way, I don't want to offend anybody, um, but I often hear from people that local honey, I mean, people selling honey, local honey will help you with your allergies. And yeah. there, there's no scientific <laughs> evidence of that at all. Uh, there are a couple of, there's one study that was done in, in um, <clears throat> somewhere in Scandinavia with birch pollen. And it was highly artificial. It wasn't done with honey. It was, uh, you know, sort of natural honey. It was honey supplemented with birch pollen. It's the only study out of, out of uh, many attempts to, to link um, local well, pollen allergies um, to, uh, 
improvement in allergies to honey consumption. I cannot find any mm. literature on that. Yet oh. I hear beekeepers often saying it'll help. Everyone says it. I, you know, you see it all over the internet. And yeah. there are anecdotal reports. Well, my cousin took it and he yeah. allergies. You can't rely on anecdotal. Snake hmm. oil. Yeah. Well, okay. yeah. well, well, you know, uh, it's kind of funny that the um, at the UC Davis about three years ago when I was taking a master's beekeepers program at the first class, first day, and then after the introduction, uh, do you have any questions? And then everybody asked that question, does local honey help allergies? And uh, the teacher flatly denying, shaking his head, nope, nope, nope. And it stunned everybody. <laughs> you know, I, I usually get a lot of attitude if I gently suggest that perhaps that's not supported by the literature. But uh, yeah, um, no, I, there's no, it, it's, it's one of these, you know, the received wisdom that has no basis in science that I can. Find. Maybe, uh, maybe have a placebo effect thinking it that, it, yeah, but. People saying, just keep saying, everybody's saying it. You know, Everyone says it. And you know it helps. What? So I, I don't. Say, huh? I was just going to say people, you see advertisements for lavender honey will help your ad allergies. Lavender from from France is going to help your allergies in <laughs> Cater, Illinois? I don't think so. Well, but yeah, it's, it's all over the internet. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, sure. Hope I haven't. Crushed anyone's hopes and dreams. Um, <laughs> Nikki, uh, did you did you say Nikki? Yeah. Okay. Well, I actually was going to also ask you about uh, about pollen allergies, but first I just want to say that the amount of stuff that you've talked about, uh, the importance of uh, planting for pollinators, and uh, you know, uh, dealing with pesticides and so on, it's been a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I'm not sure why bees that may have all of that, uh, you know, a good habitat would, uh, would not, would still not survive well. So, I mean, the fact that uh, the, um, you know, the hives may be able to get good quality honey, but not be able, uh, is there evidence that they survive better? I can't go through all the articles that you've <laughs> pop up quickly. So I'd have to read some of them to understand whether uh, that really helps. Um, but after that, I have a couple of, uh, you know, health, uh, human health questions. Yeah. Sure, not, not my strong suit, but that's all right. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the question is <clears throat> whether um, floral diversity is better for bees. You know, it, it, well, it, not just floral diversity, because it sounded like, uh, you know, they could be uh, accessing a variety of different, less nutritious sources. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So not not just floral diversity, but yeah, it's, it's a complicated question. Because it is very complicated. <laughs> it's complicated by the fact that they're bees. <laughs> right, and they're going, they're going far and they're- Far and away. Foraging and many things. They collect things that look and feel like pollen in the spring that aren't pollen, like, like dust and, and, and seeds. And, and um, that they will collect, there's one horrifying uh, account of bees who could not find a source of resins. And bees, when they collect resins for propolis, it's a specific subset of, of, of plant species, mostly in the Salicaceae, the, the um, willow um, poplar family. Um, and when, when, they, when they can't find them, they will resort to, well, this one study reported that they, they would collect asphalt, road tar. <laughs> and, and people were finding, this one study showed asphalt was like more than 16% asphalt which is heartbreaking because you know that asphalt is not going to have the phytochemicals that the resins have that they depend on. Right. Uh, it's, I don't know that it's antimicrobial, but it certainly not, cannot be good for bees. I don't, I don't right. I can't imagine it's good. Yeah. Um, right. So they, and they just collect, they will go if they're hungry, like you see, they'll go to 
open soda cans and they'll go to hummingbird feeders. They'll go to gingerbread in the depths of winter. They'll, you know, um, so they, to some degree, they know what's good for them. And I say that, even though it sounds weird to talk about an insect, but there, there's again, a paper that shows that, that bees um, in areas where willows don't, salicaceous plants are not found, honeybees will, um, seek them out in botanical gardens where they're plant, you know, they're planted as, you know, uh, non-natives. So they'll, in places in Asia, they'll plant uh, that don't have salicaceae. They'll, there'll be a botanical garden that has, look, plants from North America. And that's where the bees are collecting the uh, propolis. It's kind of astonishing how, what good chemists they are. Uh, and I, and nobody knows how they perceive. And this is a problem too. Um, they, they can perceive certain phytochemicals, but they can't perceive, they can't taste certain pesticides, which is bad because if they were deterrent, they would consume less of them. Right. Um, and there right. are even some pesticides that are feeding stimulants. Like, like, like um, I think we found glyphosate would induce feeding, which is a herbicide. Uh, so, this is a strange chemical world that they live in. It's not the chemical world they involved in. So there are all kinds of substances here that, that they do not have the equipment to process. Um, and that's one reason they don't, they, one contributing factor to why they are not thriving as they once did. Oh, okay. That's a long, you said there was another question. Yes, I have, well, I have a question because I have a friend who's been diagnosed with a bad cancer. And um, so i am uh, been looking up some of the literature on bee products and cancer. And it sounds like just as uh, there is more interest now in honey as a uh, nutritious food, um, that maybe as a result of the Manuka honey, there's more studies being done now about cancer and honey and cancer and bee venom. And so, um, I, um, at, at, the, at UCSF, um, they have a program for nutrition and cancer patients, and they're not using very much honey. And so I would like very much to find more uh, information so that uh, that integrative medicine program could start to think about what kinds of honey or you know, you know, kind of what variables they could use to uh, start to recommend to their patients. So that's one question I have is where I could get, I mean, I got a little bit of a sense of, you know, buckwheat honey and manuka and whatever, but you know, what that actually translates into in terms of how people would use it, I'm not, and, I'm not and sure. A cautionary note about the scientific literature, uh, mm -hmm. that term, covers a very broad range of right. journals. And there are a lot of journals that are publishing very low quality studies, particularly, I mean, less so, nobody cares very much about entomological studies, but cancer, um, human health, there are a lot of predatory journals that will basically publish um, uh, very, uh, well, clinical trials that aren't real, They're, they need to be the gold standard is, you know, double blind, placebo controlled, randomized clinical trials. Those are the dependable ones. And there are the, the literature is full of all kinds of journals that will publish anything. Um, and you have to be really careful uh, not to take them at face value. Uh, if, again, did I, did I end up ta uh, putting my, um, yeah. Yeah. There's my yeah. If you want to send me an email, I can look through the literature for you and see if the, I find anything reliable. I actually teach a course here called Critical Evaluation of Herbal Remedies because um, there is it's it's a jungle out there. You know, food supplements are not um, regulated like drugs are. They're considered food, um, and the standards is very different uh, and. So there, if you buy supplements, you'll see uh, you know, a little asterisk or a little dagger that says, these claims have not been substantiated by the FDA. Um, it doesn't stop 
people from advertising. So the point of the class is to equip the students with the skills to use the scientific literature to figure out what, for what there is, you know, what claims is there, are, does evidence exist for, and which right. are just nonsense. So it, I, it's, it, it's hard to say a priori, and it's, it's a shame. You know, I believe, I believe, this is not like a religion or anything, but I, I know from my own experience working with, for example, caterpillars and plants and the fact that these, you know, that different, these phytochemicals that idiosyncratically distributed across the, the plant kingdom are effective um, in an ecological context in keeping uh, insects away from plants. These phytochemicals have physiological properties, but that does not mean in an herbal product or an herbal preparation that those phytochemicals are even in there <laughs> or, or that they're in the concentrations that are meaningful. So, um, well, exactly. I mean, you know, I'm trying to find what is good science and um, it's, uh, you know, as you said, it's difficult. It's difficult to find. I find a lot more articles than I expected in recent years. So it seemed as if there's some interest in this now but the quality is hard to tell. It is hard to um, tell. I think it's all, you know, it's also uh, uh, about the, um, the um, pollen allergies. My own feeling is that it's not that there's no evidence, it's that no one has, it's almost not been studied. I found that one study that you uh, cited about birch pollen, and I thought it was pretty odd. And, um, I'm not sure, my question was going to be that I'm not sure that it's actually the pollen in the honey that is what is efficacious for this widely reported benefit for people's allergies. So I'm curious whether it's actually something entirely different because the honey that you eat at any particular time is not from the from the season when you would be using that pollen. So it doesn't make sense to me that it's the pollen that is making a difference. So I was just curious if there was some other aspect of honey that would potentially affect it. But, you know, frankly, nobody's studying it for some reason. If there's only one study, that doesn't mean it's not efficacious. No, no, there's means... only one study that shows any effect. There are other studies well, that show no effect. Oh, okay. Those I haven't found. Yeah, um, just I, I tweeted about it once and got trolled mercilessly. So um, <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. But I can I could resurrect that. Uh, there there are people who have done appropriate controlled studies and uh, have found no statistical effect. Okay, I'd be curious how they set up their studies. Okay. <laughs> Again, send me a note. I, I may not respond immediately, but um, I can send you the, the literature that I do. I have found. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. This was a very interesting uh, talk all around, changing my thinking about beekeeping and uh, and humans too. <laughs> Great, that's wonderful. I, yeah. Like I said, I, I never know what people know. Uh, or beekeepers are among the best informed lay public uh about this one insect so yeah uh, so yeah, um, it's great we have a wonderful impressive. series of groups around the bay area so it's wonderful thank you um, oh my pleasure uh, eugenie 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 yeah are you there okay. yeah i'm there i just had to turn myself back on again so uh, just picking up on on sung's um comment um, I, I appreciated all the discussion about uh, the FDA approving uh, honeys for wound treatment, but it seems from just from your summary that the most efficacious use of honeys were external. And yeah. I, if, you're, if you're not a bee, I mean, the thing is mammals, <laughs> mammals exactly. have a very different digestive system yeah. than bees exactly. do. And I'm wondering whether the claims for um, efficacy of treating all kinds of diseases when you ingest honey are going to be less likely. Yep, I mean, all, all bets are I, yes. Yeah. yeah. And FDA um, has not approved them for anything other than um, the surface. Versa. Uh, well, it, for bandages. Yeah. 
Which, I mean, I, put put them put them on your skin, your in your gut. You know, it yeah. just tastes good. <laughs> it's then, not, not necessarily going to cure you of anything. There's now what what are called cosmeceuticals. So in cosmetics, there are uh, again, cosmetics are not regulated the same way that that drugs are. It's the same problem um, that there is for these health foods. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, nutraceuticals and. Um, herbal remedies and the like, food supplements. Uh, and uh, the theory behind um, the uh, use of, of honey for um, wrinkles and such is that it, the humectant properties, the ability to draw moisture out of the air. Um, <laughs> one reason, um, if you cook with honey, you bake with honey, what you make will stay fresher longer than if you bake with sugar because um, the honey will- uh, Higher moisture. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's, it, it's a humectant. It will pull moisture out of the air so it won't go stale quite as fast. But um, you know, but you put, putting honey on your skin to make your, to, as a moisturizer, yeah. back, back in anthropology, we'd call that sympathetic magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, it's- um, But it's a multi, it's probably billion dollar business. Oh yeah. Amazing to me. <laughs> These yeah. these are rich witch doctors. <laughs> quote, quote our friend Sue Donahue, <laughs> snake oil. <laughs> Thank you very much, May. This was really fun. Oh, sure. Um, and we got, okay, Ralph. Yeah, another question. Um, I think with slide 51, one of your bullet points says that honey regulates blood sugar. How does it do that? Oh, was that one of the... Um, uh, long list of things that honey's purported to do. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Because I, I, you know, I don't. Uh, that's from the internet. You know, uh, oh, not okay. site. So I. Yeah. Thank you. I understand then. <laughs> <coughs> it just, and it's funny to compare. Um, you can um, find list of ten ways honey can improve your health, 12 ways honey can improve your, improve your health, 18 ways honey that, you know, it just keeps escalating. And uh, I don't know how much, I mean, again, I don't think bees have ulcers. So I don't think I have to worry about the efficacy of ulcer treatment. And a lot of these claims are based on in vitro tests. So you have a dish of uh, Helicobacter pylori, the, the bacterium that causes ulcers. And you can kill in a petri dish. You can kill the bacterium. Does not mean it's going to work inside the body. So, a lot of these claims are not right. supported. Again, Internet by science the is no, no science. Yeah. Right. May just to quickly jump in uh, the difference between sugar in your gut and bacteria. Sugar break sugar messes with your gut bacteria much more heavily than does. Um, using honey as a sweetener does not affect your gut bacteria uh, as much. Yeah, it's remarkable stuff. I'm glad people are finally recognizing that. Um, Richard. Uh, May, I apologize. I missed a lot of your talk. I was on another Zoom. We were talking about using honey on the surface. I just want to report that I've used Manuka uh, gel and Manuka ointment and it's extremely effective for abscesses, particularly for a condition called granulomatous mastitis, where abscesses develop deep, usually into the breast area. And it, it's incredibly effective. It, it just, you know, rather than having to use a lot of the uh, antibacterial other elements, I, I found honey is just superbly effective. And probably any honey would do that, but Manuka honey is the one that they sell and make money on, right? Although actually uh, part of the talk was about a particular component that's found in uh, the Manuka um, shrubs uh, nectar that becomes methyl glyoxal, which is an extraordinarily effective antibacterial agent. Right, right. Yeah, so it, there, there are, you know, all honeys have this sort of peroxide based antibacterial agent, but there are honeys that have antibacterial uh, activity beyond that and they're called non-peroxide um honey right thanks uh, so much yeah sure sure uh, uh liz hi may hi great presentation thank you well, thank you 
Um, two questions. One, uh, should we be storing honey in the dark? Is there any benefit to that? I, I've actually um, been told yes, because uh, some of these um, pigments, actually, the carotenoids, for example, are not light stable. So um, they would break down over time uh, if there's light exposure. That's what I was thinking. I'm going to stop keeping it on my counter. Um, the other question is, I've, I was chatting with Paula about um, how great it would be if we could send off our honey samples to be analyzed so we could start identifying different tastes with different pollens and nectars. And she actually looked into that one time because she had a very uh, bitter tasting honey. And um, it was, I think it was $5,000 was the cost to do that. <laughs> so a random question here, but um, I was wondering how involved is it to test for honey? What would it cost to set up a small at-home lab if that would even be possible? In interesting question because there are testing facilities that have far lower prices, but the vast majority, there's uh, Scott McCart at Cornell operates one. There's, I think it's University of Guelph. There's one in Canada. Um, and uh, my colleague, Adam Dolezal works on pesticides and bees, routinely ships his honey off for analysis, but they're not looking for phytochemicals. They're looking for pesticides. Mm. I don't know if anyone, other, you know, we analyze honey for its phytochemical content, but we're not a commercial operation or anything. People are not accustomed to thinking about it. Mostly they're worried about pesticides. Um, so it, it would be complicated. <laughs> we have to have a, a, you know, either, you know, a, a, like a, for example, a GCMS or an HPLC MS. So a, so a high pressure liquid chromatograph slash um, a mass spectrometer or a gas chromatograph slash mass spectrometer, and they run $250,000 more. So. Okay, probably not something the club can buy yet then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, May. <laughs> not, even, not even used. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, well. Uh, and then there's um, Alan. Yeah, sure. I, I just had a quick question. I appreciate your comments about the bogus claims made um, on the internet for various efficacy, but I do think I heard you say something about the use of honey, a, a study that was on the use of honey for sweetening tea uh, and uh, the improvement in health. And was that just another example of a bogus study or was that no, something? No, that was my colleague, Nikki Engaseth, um, uh, who, as far as I know, that was the per first, let me get, I, sh I should have had it on the slide. I apologize for that. Um, I'm gonna do a quick search on Google Scholar. Um, and uh, yeah, this study was done at University of Illinois and uh, it was, um, it has all kinds of citations now. Okay. Yes. Well, I can look it up. I don't need to take your time. What, what was the name again? Uh, okay. Uh, here it is. Let's, let's see. Um, uh, first author is uh, Geldof, uh, G-H-E-L-D-O-F. And she's the last author, Engeseth, E-N-G-E-S-E-T-H. And uh, the study's called Buckwheat Honey Increases Serum, Serum Antioxidant Capacity in Humans. Um, and it has, well, uh, come on. Let me see. Yes, honey's been observed. Okay, conclusions. In the present study, the acute effect of consumption of 500 ml of water, water with buckwheat honey, black tea, black tea with sugar, or black tea with buckwheat honey on serum oxidative reactions. Examined in 25 healthy men. And you know what I'll do? I'll just put the link in Zoom to the article. Great, thank you. Let me get back to Zoom here. Type message and paste. Let's see if this works. Yay, there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna do return. There it is. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, that's the one, 2003. 120 citations. Uh, okay, um, let me get rid of this. Any other question? Oh, uh, Tom? Hello. So I'm frequently asked by people 
what types of flowers they might be able to plant to help bees. And I'm curious if you have any recommendations based on some of your findings. Well, um, well, sunflowers, remember the study where uh, the sick nurses with Nosema uh, sought out sunflower? They really like sunflower. Um, and it does seem there's an increasing number of papers showing that there are, are antimicrobial agents that work for bees in sunflower. Um, but you can't grow those all year long, you know, uh, you can't grow them in every place. Um, and again, I don't want to, it's not a good thing if all they get is sunflower. I, 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 it really seems, and, and Earl, what's his name? Erler, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, there's now a kind of a, uh, I guess, a community of scholars that, that have embraced the concept that, uh, that uh, the hive is essentially the, you know, the honey stores are um, part of the social existence of honeybees and, and they are, um, they, they use this uh, as, uh, well, it's kind of called, uh, um, zoopharmacognosy. So they, they, they're they animals that use natural substances, often from plants, to, to cure themselves, to, to treat illnesses. And this has been reported in mammal, many mammals. Um, some of the apes, for example, seek out certain plants when they're, when they're not feeling well. Uh, not very well known from insects. It's kind of astonishing what what these are capable of doing. I don't know if that was an answer or if that was a question or. Uh, no, right, yeah. So it seems like a, a diversity is key. So just. Yeah. And they need it. I mean, <clears throat> flowers that grow in May are not the same flowers that grow in August. Right. And so it seems like they can, if you include sunflowers, that would be great because they could potentially store the beneficial aspects of sunflowers for later later in the year. I, yeah, I, I say that not knowing, you know, whether that's true for all bees. Sure, sure. Genetics plays a role. Um, uh, and uh, there's not, it's not intensively studied, uh, but at least in a, in a handful of studies. And one, I believe um, in bumblebees too, the same um, helpful effect has been shown. But again, not a whole rich literature of, of evidence. And I know it's okay. tempting to, you know, plant what they need. You know, you know this effort to plant nothing but uh, milkweeds for monarchs. Well, monarch butterflies uh, don't. Uh, the larvae feed exclusively on milkweeds. The adults feed on nectar on all kinds of flowers. So sure, you have to feed all life stages to keep a species from going extinct. So, I mean, not that bees are going extinct, but um, yeah. So they Great. nobody knows anything about what what's best in terms of food for larvae, virtually nothing. I mean, we, we found that p-cumeric acid has all these uh, um, remarkable properties in, in larvae, but I, I can't tell you which, which nectars will produce the best uh, honey for baby bees versus you know, well, grubs versus adult bees. Sure. We're just now doing a study, which I, I don't think has ever been done before, <laughs> comparing three different monoflorals to see what effect they have on, on longevity and pesticide uh, tolerance. So not just these individual compounds, but the actual honeys that are purportedly monoflorals. But we're still analyzing data. I can't really talk about that right now, but it, it just never occurred to, any, to anybody, I think, to, to compare how honeys, different honeys, um, uh, how bees perform on different honeys. Great. That sounds really interesting. I look forward to, to uh, reading that when it comes out. I, yeah, Thank you. We hope it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I, I think that's all I see. Is that everybody's questions? Is that right? Oh, wait, Gregory? Yeah, I, I had a uh, first a comment. Um, Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I'm sure glad we uh, are videotaping it because 
I'm going to have to watch that a few times. <laughs> you, you seem to toss a lot of big words and a lot of unusual phrases that I haven't heard uh, very easily. So, um, well, I try. I've, I try to put the words on the screen just for that purpose. No, yeah, but it's it's great. Um, I just I'm just impressed that uh, I mean, uh, on um, my uh, my feeling is that uh, you you would rate very high on my list of nerd nerd level of information on bee on honey <laughs> so uh, but yeah. i did i did have a uh comment i i was thinking that you mentioned that a lot of the um the uh antimicrobial capacity of honey was linked to um primarily the uh the, the concentration of it and the lack of water but the truth is that we add water to it when we eat it. So, yeah. I mean, does that like, that really doesn't work then, does it? Right, well, that's part of it, why the most um, compelling evidence for health benefits for humans are the external applications. And abscesses, even though they're into the body, they're basically, um, it, it's different from ingesting. It's still through time. Right. But uh, yeah, so it it's, we're not equipped to eat bees, uh, honey, the way bees are equipped to eat honey. So even even your comment about how honey can, um, I, I guess, affect that. Uh, I guess there was some um, the 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 um, thing that caused stone brood. Uh -huh. You said, was, yeah. yeah, and that, that was how did it attack that? Did it was it a chemical reaction or was it because of the lack of moisture? No, no. Um, it, this was the study we did is was the the toxin produced by um, Aspergillus flavus is uh, called aflatoxin. Uh, you may have heard of it because it's the contaminant that keeps almond growers from selling their almonds, even for cattle food, because it's one of the most carcinogenic substances known. And uh, we got started on this because it was uh, we were looking at other insects. It's deadly to most insects. It's, um, but there are insects that live with fungus and uh, like the corn earworm is resistant to, it, you know, when it attacks corn, fungi colonize, the aflatoxins don't seem to affect the corn earworm very much. And much to our shock and amazement, honeybees are fairly tolerant of aflatoxin. And the only way that made sense to us is that bee bread is full of aspergillus species, including aspergillus flavus. So we are, actually funded to figure, oh, well, this is an interesting thing. One of my graduate students' thesis project involved um, culturing the fun, the Aspergillus flavus. So Aspergillus flavus is basically a soil fungus, um, but it's everywhere. And it's an opportunistic um, pathogen. It can infect plants. That's why it's a problem in almonds. It can infect insects. That's why a problem in snow, a stone root. And it's pathogenic because it makes this these aflatoxins. Uh, bees are fairly resistant to aflatoxins. This is very complicated because these P450s, these enzymes, okay, um, you add an oxygen functionality and it makes it more soluble. Well, aflatoxins trick uh, animals because most P450 reactions um, make it more toxic. It's called bioactivation. Bees do not bioactivate aflatoxin, which is remarkable in and of itself, which suggests they have a long evolutionary history. And again, if you sample bee bread, you will find Aspergillus flavus. You will also find Aspergillus niger. We use Aspergillus arisi, which is a relative of Aspergillus niger, to make soy, uh, soy products, soy sauce, uh, other soy products. Uh, but it happens to be a strain of Aspergillus, of which there are hundreds, that doesn't have the biosynthetic pathway to make aflatoxin. So my student, Daniel Bush, cultured um, bee bread to see which fungi grow in it, found Aspergillus flavus. And the strain is different from the strain that is, um, uh, well, actually uses a biocontrol agent in um, cotton to outcompete other fungi. This Aspergillus flavus he found in bee bread is very osmotolerant. And it, has very, it grows very well in low pH. And uh, um, it's resistant to the uh, antimicrobial activity of propolis, which suggests that maybe the bees selected this or 
cultivated it, cultured it, domesticated it. So uh, compared to the pathogenic form of Aspergillus flavus, what causes stone brood, um, this strain does not appear, we, we had it, uh, we sequenced the genome and it does not have, it has a stop codon or, or a stop signal that keeps the fungus from making aflatoxin. So it looks for all intents and purposes like bees did what we did and domesticated a fungus to help us ferment food to make it less, less um, more nutritious and less, less um, dangerous. But that's not published yet either, uh, but it's very exciting. We just got the pathogenic strain and the comparisons there, even though they have the same scientific name, they're very different. And one strain grows really well on a beehive and the other one grows really well in an animal. So. Um, How do you uh, distinguish between the two different fungi? I mean, is it is it a visual thing? Can you visually see that it's different or? No, no. Um, no. Well, D Daniel can tell Aspergillus flavus by looking and seeing, but you have to do, you know, sort of biochemical or genetic confirmation of species identity. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so it would be easy if they were color coded, but they're not. <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> I know a lot of fungus have different physical appearances, not just color, but I mean, yeah. just the way they look and stuff or the way they grow. Um, yeah, and, and um, <clears throat> well, he can, he can recognize Aspergillus flavus. I, I never even tried, but um, uh, they, they, they have different physiological properties, which you can't tell by looking at. You just have to, you know, see how they respond to uh, grow them and see if they'll grow in the presence of propolis, see if they'll grow at low pH, um, which is what he's done. So uh, you lost me there. Did you say Aspergillus is what causes stone brood? Is that? Um, Aspergillus what? flavus, the same species. But same species. Probably Aspergillus causes a condition called aspergillo aspergillosis. When humans inhale it, it infects okay. the lung. Same, same species. But there's oh. forms that live in the soil. There's some forms that, that are pathogens in humans. There are forms that, that grow on plants. It's wow. The very opportunistic fun. You, you want to get the, well, no, that's not, we don't know. But, but it's the same species. And then they, within the species, they have different, I don't know what you call strains that will affect differently. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, species are defined by people, you know. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, the biological species concept is, you know, you can't interbreed. Well, that's not applied in practice often. So um, what the mycology community considers one species may actually be dozens or hundreds. But okay. At the moment for conventional mycology, that's one species. Well, to me, if it's, it has different phenotypes or whatever, how, how it affects things, it's it would be a different species but maybe they just don't know how to do you know maybe in five years it will be when all the genomes are sequenced so everything is kind of getting redefined yeah well obviously if they can tell the difference between them genetically i mean you, you said they could tell the difference then there must be some difference between them right or or can they yeah but we we humans define what percent difference makes us feel. oh okay yeah right right 